Anna, welcome to the Great Big Book Club. It's really lovely to see you there. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. I'm in the middle of pre-publication. It's all happening. Um, publication day is actually in a couple of days, but you know, it's all happening now. So it's fun. It's been lovely weather. And actually, you know, there are horrors going on in the world, but I'm fine at the moment. So I'm so excited about your latest book, The Seduction. Um, it's the fifth book in a series of novels, which six. I mean, I think six, sorry, yes, yeah. yeah, six, um, which, you know, amazingly, they're not only award winning, critically acclaimed, but um, bestsellers as well so it seems like you know you're in a rather wonderful situation the good reviews are starting to already come in for the seduction and it's such a gripping book I mean it's so intelligent and also in some ways terrifying of what could go wrong <laughs> on the psychotherapist's couch um, in fact, I hope you've got a copy of the book there that you can I hold do. up because I think it's so redolent of, you know, that a copy. I don't know if you can see that, that red that? couch. It's, it's a good cover, isn't it? It's really, yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think is just so good about this book is the way that you take a family that on the surface seems like this lovely wholesome successful <laughs> warm family and then running all the way through it is this dark seam of desire the potential for disaster and destruction and how everything can come tumbling down which we know is the case in yes. real life um, the way you start with, what's the first line? Danger wore a sweet face. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bit of a sign to, of things to come there. Yes. Exactly. So I wonder if to begin with, your, we, we enter in the book Beth's life when it's all turning upside down, things are spinning out of control, but then you go very quickly back to a year previously when it seems kind of rather lovely. There she is, a pretty successful artist. She's got her lovely young daughter, Fern, and a husband who sounds pretty ideal, Sol, her American photographer husband, who, I mean, you know, he's intelligent, sexy, a good dad. He makes pancakes at the weekend. <laughs> They live in a lovely house in Camden by the canal. What on earth could come along to make her thrill that way? So I just wondered whether you could start mm -hmm. off by kind of giving us a picture of, of Beth and her life. Okay, well, you've given us a very good picture of Beth and her life. And actually, it does sound ideal. But I suppose at the same time, psychologically, she, she doesn't let it be ideal because she's troubled. Um, and in fact, she worries that it's too good, that it's all possibly too good and will come tumbling down, as indeed it does. Um, but uh, yes, where we start her, her life, she's, yeah, she's, got a, she's got a good husband, she's got a good career, she's got a, a child, it's pretty lovely. Um, but because her mother abandoned her when she was 13, she has all sorts of issues and pretty quickly, her daughter starts disappearing for longer and longer periods of time. And she's not sure whether this is just independence and adolescence or whether actually it's something else is happening. And so, you know, there are things that are worrying her. And actually, as her husband points out, her work is becoming darker, which she hasn't really noticed. So a kind of psychological crisis is brewing. And then she goes to see the therapist. So tell us about Tamara Bywater. Such a great name as well. It's funny, I had that name right from the beginning. I just thought for some reason she has to be called Dr. Tamara Bywater. Um, well, she appears to be one thing and in some ways she's another. So she's, she's attractive, she's um, probably in, she's early to mid forties. 
Uh, we don't know much about her for quite a long time, except for she's probably married because she's got a wedding ring. This is the thing with shrinks, you know, you're not supposed to know anything about them, of course. And for a long time, she doesn't give away anything about herself. But Beth starts just seeing little clues like, oh, what's that under the desk? Is, is that a high heel? You know, that does not look like the therapist that I'm seeing, the slightly dowdy, you know, very sensible, very boundaried woman. And then Tamara Bywater starts giving away a little bit more about herself. And she's certainly charismatic and I get troubled in herself. And I don't want to give everything away, but there's, there's quite a lot more than that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I found very interesting, I think anybody who's ever had any therapy will recognize that curiosity and the intimacy of the setting um, when you're with a therapist or an analyst or whatever it is. There's a bit I wanted to quote that you said, there's nothing quite like it. You sit together in hushed intimacy, just the two of you, finally revealing lifelong secrets and then it continues you start to feel you know them they're like a parent in real life you would be friends you almost feel you love them and it's such a strange setting because this this idea of transference is when things are taken more to extremes and perhaps we could go on to talk about that but i think that um the the idea of fantasizing about who your therapist is must be incredibly common it is it really is because you know we're human we're curious we want to know who we're talking to and you know it is someone you're telling really things you may never have talked about before very deep intimate things and they do need to be this blank screen but of course you get you become very curious and I, it's it's common and it depends on what the therapist does with it tell um, us a bit about transference okay transference it's really just the projection of feelings that you have and you you probably haven't resolved them so by and large from the past it's the projection of those onto someone else so onto the therapist and it's not necessarily love feelings i mean that's a whole arena that's erotic transference it's it could be anger you know it could be resent resentment you could be um mixing them up in some way in your mind with you know a parent it's all sorts of things you're you're transferring onto them but lots of patients do think they've fallen in love with their therapist so, so so that kind of love transference is very common actually and it's no wonder because this person represents something they're on your side it is all very intimate and they seem wonderful they're helping you and you don't know anything about them ideally <laughs> so <laughs> so you can put onto them whatever you want and I say ideally, and that is the ideal. And most therapists absolutely are professional and bounded, and you could trust, you know, the vast majority of therapists. I'm writing about a therapist you can't trust ultimately, but that's rare. Absolutely. And do you think, I mean, one of the things I thought about is how in your previous books, the, the touching on um, the forbidden and um, the obsessive and how our civilized lives have this this potential for something much more savage a sort of dark underbelly that exists that we don't we don't see or show but which is there and and that's come out in in several of your books i mean notably your great bestseller sleep with me uh, with a, a love triangle but also with you which I thought was really marvellous about a young girl who has an affair with her teacher and then it emerges that actually the teacher's wife is is having an affair with the girl's mother so it gets very very complicated and um, I wondered whether you're reaching out whether it's harder these days to find a love that's forbidden I mean, in the old days, forbidden loves were kind of there for the taking. They were all over the place. These days, with people being so much more liberated and tolerant, 
um, one has to search a little bit further. But you know, there's no doubt that the psychotherapist is forbidden. <laughs> Yes, I think you're completely right. It's something I hadn't really thought about. For instance, someone, is it Alan Hollinghurst, said the gay novel is dead, as in, you know, everyone now can write about gay characters or whatever sexuality. And, you know, there, there are not categories in that same way. And no one turns a hair. I mean, it's, it's like, so, so to some extent, that transgressive, area that I was writing about. I mean, my first novel, Mothers and Other Lovers, which is a long time ago, it was 1994. You know, that was like, oh, there's a, there's a um, gay female relationship in that. And that was a big thing. And now it's, it's nothing, which is real progress. It really so, is. I mean, the difference between um, how gay relationships were seen then, even 15, 20 years ago and now. I mean, it's, it's so changed, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I hasten to add, you know, in my own country and in certain um, milieu it is, obviously globally there are still huge problems, but I think within, you know, the arena I'm working in, it's radically changed, just as you said in the last few years. So you're right, a kind of um, forbidden or transgressive love is difficult to find to some extent. I mean, you've written about it yourself in Putney, absolutely. And that's, you know, that is the biggest transgression and the biggest sin of all, what you were writing about, which is child abuse. Um, so that's a whole different area. And obviously that will always be rightly forbidden. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, it's, it's very interesting though how these things change and how in some ways, I mean, when I wrote Putney, it was set in the 70s mm -hmm. and then the, the review of how things were seen in the present day. So in some ways, um, things were more tolerant then and they've actually tightened up quite rightly as you say and become things have become much stricter so any hint of of sexualizing underage people even teenagers is not tolerated I mean it was funny for me thinking about that and reading your book you the same sort of thing going back to to those days when teachers did have flings with teenage pupils and yes it was forbidden but it it all went on an awful lot more, I think. I've discovered in adulthood that it went on a lot more than I thought. And actually, I think it's terrible, really terrible. And I think we're right to think that's awful. So, yes, yeah, in some definitely. ways it changes in both directions, but I think in both cases in the right directions. Um, so, yes, the whole idea of transgression or something that's forbidden, a therapist certainly is it is again rightly forbidden but it happens it happens it happens you know there are statistics on this and i didn't want to go too far down kind of a research route but in this particular story it is because the therapist herself is narcissistic and she really wants something out of beth which is that kind of supply that is attention and she likes the idea of her world and things like that so um, she does transgress in a way that, you know, therapists would be struck off for and most wouldn't even dream of doing. And do you think from Beth's point of view that she's, she's sort of too comfortable with her lovely marriage and family? Is it that thing that, you know, the, the sex therapist Esther Perel said about um, mating in captivity? Is it? <laughs> Good expression, you know, it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that it's all just too cosy and nice, and that many humans do have that that need for, as you say, for transgression, for the forbidden, for something with danger and something unknown. Yes, that's a good point. I think with Beth, she says she partly takes it for granted. She actually says it herself. She partly takes it for granted and partly worries it will all end. But I think people in long marriages, you know, it is very common, of course, to want some excitement, to fantasize about other people, actually harmlessly, kind of why not? 
if it's just if it's just fantasy i think it's normal um but there is she does feel there's something missing she feels there's a kind of wilder life that she wants like she she imagines going on a raft and rapids and um just she feels there might be something she's missing out on even though she really really does appreciate what she has and so that destructive streak starts coming in she starts really self-sabotaging and that's kind of what it's about yeah yeah um joanna were you going to do a little reading or two have you got anything prepared yeah. that you to give us a text i was going to do two one one very short one um which was uh just about when beth is getting very unhappy and um at this point she really needs the therapy so it says every night was a land she entered she approached it knowing she would travel temporarily eased through the comfort of darkness before something rocky and acidic slowly surfaced pressing against her until it woke her in the hours before dawn the acid seemed to soak into her brain and pump out self-disgust bright images rained down on her her mother turning round to wave at her in her bedroom, her mother's hospital bed, the window by Sefton Park. She had turned 13 three weeks before her mother left, and it was the not knowing Beth couldn't bear, the cowish ignorance of what was to come. So wow. that was the first. Yeah. The first. <laughs> so it sets up because her mother has really damaged her, and it, you know, as any mother would by leaving a child at 13, and so, you know, this does set up a lot of the themes and I'm quite kind of openly Freudian in quite a pat way that there's actually, she's kind of chasing her mother. With the yes, thing. exactly. And so do you think in some ways to begin with, at least, she was hoping that her therapist might be more of a mother figure? I think she kind of experiences her in a maternal way at the beginning um and then sexualizes that later but at the beginning i don't know if it's about hope i think that's what she feels because the therapist has this very lulling voice it's a very soft actually quite maternal kind of atmosphere there there's low lighting in the consulting room and and um she's very kind to her and very warm to her at first and mothers and daughters are quite a theme aren't they running through your work um, in, in many of your books? I wondered if you'd like to touch on that right from your first novel. Uh, yes, as I'm discovering, mothers and daughters are quite a theme. I wonder why, as a daughter and a mother of a daughter, um, yes, so my first book couldn't have spelt mothers and other lovers, couldn't have spelled it out more clearly. Um, I just can't seem to get away from this theme, although what I'm writing now is kind of getting away from it. Maybe I've expressed all I need to. I did have a troubled relationship with my own mother. I mean, I obviously this was something I wanted to sort out. It got a lot better. It, it got a lot better in later life. And, you know, I would always give her credit that when I really confronted her, she, um, she worked on it. And we were much closer and we were much closer after I gave birth, actually, in that kind of classic way. I think, you know, the love and the uh, the focus transfers itself and then you're freer to see the person who your mother is. And so I just wanted to explore all these things. But I am kind of changing themes now. I wanted to ask you what you're writing about, actually. Can you say anything about it? Well, I can say I'm writing another novel because I've written both fiction and non-fiction so it's set in Greece and it involves a woman having a love affair with a former terrorist so, so a Greek terrorist so yeah <laughs> so you like a bit of you like a bit of transgression yourself a bit of you? transgression going on there as well exactly we do we definitely have some themes in common which is interesting but what I love um about about your work is is the prose style it's just that's what i find so exquisite because actually as a reader and to some extent as a writer that's what really motivates me and um it's just the lyrical 
the extraordinary lyrical pro style that you have that really, really excites me. Oh, um, you're very lovely. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not being lovely. I'm being truthful. And so I'm just wondering for yourself and we can discuss this, whether um, it is the prose that motivates you in the first place or is it, is it a theme or is it a plot? I think it's a mixture of everything. I mean, for me, reading a book, if it isn't written with interesting, stimulating and hopefully beautiful prose, it's not really going to be worth it. Um, having said that, I do think that plot is important as well. So people who say plot doesn't matter um, and you can just have characters, I don't really go along with that. I think there needs to be a sense of being pulled along. And um, I mean, you manage that very beautifully with your amazing prose, which has this kind of dark, glittering quality to it, I think, um, which is so interesting because often it will begin in this, as I said at the beginning, this, this quite kind of almost cosy atmosphere of family life. But there's this diamond darkness to it that you sense through the quality of the writing. And I think that's what's so clever that they can actually be working at different levels. It's funny, isn't it? Because the Guardian Review said something like that. We, you know, we're here to learn about our own, our own writing and it's very difficult to see yourself what you're doing. I don't know if you find that. but Absolutely. So someone else um, defining it is interesting but I think so I think there's a kind of darkness that comes out that I don't express that much in my real life um, that comes out in the prose and often I shock myself I'm like gosh I'm darker than I think in my work <laughs> I mean I like that I think I like really dark fiction often as long as as you say there's a plot to pull you through it I think plot is vital even though prose yeah. excites me yeah. Uh, could you just say a little bit about your your writing life, your routine? So, I mean, I'm always interested in how people manage their writing day to day, but also I'm fascinated by how a novelist sets up um, starting to write a novel, because some people say they just have this little idea and they they push themselves forth not knowing where they're going to go, and other people have rooms surrounded with folders and files and post-its and know exactly so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about both those things. Yes it's something I think about a lot because you're right I find different writers are completely different with this and um, actually when I teach creative writing at Faber Academy I always say look people do this very differently but if you do have some kind of plot or some kind of direction that you're going in it is a safety net so what I do is I start with, you know, that first throb of an idea and I get very excited at the beginning because I think I, I know that that's what I want to write about. When it comes to me, I'm not short on ideas. I just find it difficult writing. <laughs> um, but when it comes to me, it's absolutely what I want to write. And so I immediately write notes on it very quickly before it goes. And that's about the whole theme and, and or the character or whatever has occurred to me. And for me, it's really vital to have two files going at the same time. So on my computer, I'll have notes and I'll have the manuscript. And it's also important to me to get on with the manuscript quite quickly because once I've had that initial idea and made some initial notes, if I don't get on with the novel itself, um, I could be forever in my notes file. So I found that I do both at once. And but every time I have a thought about the plot, I go back to the notes file. So I really flip between those two the whole time. Um, yes, I find that helps a lot. Do you make, I, I also try to make chapter plans at least before I actually start writing a chapter so I do know where it's going. That's good. No, I thought before maybe I should do that. Um, I've never done actual chapter plans. It's more like, um, a rough outline and then very many muddled detailed notes that I have to keep going through and cut and put little headings so I can find them. But maybe it's simpler to do chapter plans. So what, what stage do you do chapter plans? 
Um, I'll try and do a kind of broad one at the beginning and then as I'm going along I'll make them a bit more detailed so that I've got something so I kind of know where I'm going to go next. Oh. Um, but from what you say then, once you've got this file of notes, you need to kind of really push on with things and, and get going. So does that mean that you write a book very quickly and then have a gap? Or do you, how, do, how does that work? I just can only go like this, I wish. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm so slow. No, I do make myself get going with it, definitely. But I've, I'm just lamentably slow. What can I say? I'm not going to be this time. <laughs> um, I don't know what happens. I, I procrastinate. Um, you do write a lot of articles though, don't you? And pieces for newspapers and book reviews. So I don't think you're twiddling your thumbs. You're pretty busy. No, I, I, I can't use that as an excuse. I did used to. And then after Sleep With Me, I could afford for a while to write full time. Um, and so I pretty much stopped. What I do is I write articles and, and, and uh, the odd book review, but I do them to promote my novel. So I do them at the time I have a novel coming out and I enjoy that. I enjoy going back to that journalism. No, but I've had children and, you know, I've, I had young children. They're now 20 and 17. So we're in a different phase. And it's, I have loads of time now. Really. So how does your writing day get going? Are you one of those get up early and get on with it? Or do you wait for inspiration? I mean, people seem to have such different ways of going about it. Is it inspiration or perspiration or both? My ideal writing day is so different. The one in my head is so different from the reality. I don't <laughs> believe in waiting for inspiration at all. I do believe in thinking it's a job and trying to treat it as a job but then I do you know mess around what I do pre-lockdown is trying to be normal get dressed and jump on a bus because otherwise I'll sit around in my nighty, you know just crying and procrastinating and going oh my novel's terrible I can't so if I try to be a normal person with a normal day job <laughs> it really does help and sometimes where do, I say, where do you go oh, on the bus? British Library. So it's really door to door. It's about half an hour. It's very easy. And there is a swimming pool right nearby. So sometimes I'll swim before on a very good day. Um, and then it really helps to have friends in the library. Sometimes I have loads of friends there. Sometimes no one and I'm lonely. But if friends are there, we'll text, we'll ignore each other and text each other for lunch. You know, just like, when are we meeting? And that's an ideal writing day um and then do you go back after lunch or or do things mm. kind of wind down after lunch no i do base myself in the british library but i can't say that i put in a wonderful full even nine to five because i don't know i'm terrible i do start chatting or like okay yeah let's have tea at three um this time i'm just gonna get on with it actually and i have during lockdown it's been a bit better and there is no excuse i've written twenty thousand of my new novel twenty thousand words i've got a real outline so there's no excuse this time i will have this done <laughs> <laughs> you too we need to pledge to each other we need to give each other a deadline <laughs> so maybe lockdown is just the thing because there are fewer parties and fewer distractions and um, all those friends asking you for tea at the British Library. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm just, I'm temperamentally completely unsuited to writing. I'm just very sociable and I love seeing my friends. And so, you know, why did I choose this profession where I have to lock myself down anyway and just write? But I just can't seem to do anything else. It's what I've always, always wanted to do. So, but now lockdown has helped me be slightly less sociable. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so Joanna, before we finish, was there another reading that you'd like to do? Okay, shall I just do the second, um, the second reading, which has got, it, it's, it's quite different. Um, yes. So, this is in the consulting room 
with Dr. Bywater, with Beth in the consulting room. Um, and Beth has become really quite fixated on Dr. Bywater by this stage, but kind of nothing, nothing overt has happened. So Dr. Bywater paused expressionless. She seemed to be forcing herself to speak. We should explore the transference that's going on here, she said. I know about that, you mean? Beth said flippantly, stiffening to ward away a blush. Then I think you're my mum, my dad, that I think I'm in love with you because I've confused you with some past figure. Dr Bywater smiled and straightened her face. I think there are issues of transference and counter-transference, she said. I'll get researching, said Beth, steadying her breathing. You know, much of the efficacy of the therapy rests on what goes on in this room. Beth gazed at the wall behind. The relationship between the therapist and the client, said Dr. Whitewater. Beth nodded. She couldn't catch her eye. A heat and a suppressed smile were rising through her. But it has to obey long established boundaries. Beth's mouth stiffened. We bond said Dr. Bywater. Do we? Sometimes I think too much. Oh, she's such a chilling character, that doctor, Tamara Bywater. That, I mean, kind of, that scene kind of sums it up. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a wonderful book, Joanna. Many, many congratulations. And this, your publication week, I mean, it's in a couple of days, isn't it? But um really i'd recommend this book to anybody it's the perfect summer read or all winter read come to that it's just needs to be absolutely breathed in um so many many congratulations and lovely to talk with you today thank you so much so good to talk to you thank you